Today on Chainlinked, Carl Flersch, also known as Carl.Tech, and Ben Jones from Optimism PBC explain their recent release that enables EVM equivalents. That's a technical standard that's designed to make deploying applications and smart contracts to Optimism Layer 2 exactly equivalent to deploying on Ethereum Layer 1. We talk about what EVM equivalence means for end users, developers, Chainlink, and how Carl's philosophy on Ethereum has changed over the years. We also get a sneak peek into Ben's Ethereum parody music hobby and talk a little gaming. It's a great chat. Stick around for it. Chainlinked is a Web3 podcast series talking to the builders in the Chainlink ecosystem. We get to know the human side of the people bringing the many applications of Chainlink blockchain middleware to life. My name is Dr. Andy Boyan. You can call me Andy and I'll be your host. Now let's get into optimism and EVM equivalents, starting with Carl Flersch, then Ben Jones comes on in a minute. All right. Well, right now we are very much talking about EVM equivalents. And so I think that that is the number one kind of defining feature that we are most excited by to kind of understand where optimism sits or optimistic Ethereum sits is we kind of see a future where the blockchain ecosystem has a lot of EVM deployments in various contexts across, you know, a wide spectrum of applications. Like we're using Solidity, we're using the EVM. And so what optimistic Ethereum is doing is it is trying to replicate exactly like the magic that we get with Ethereum layer one, with Ethereum mainnet, but do it in a more scalable context in layer two. So what I think of is the user experience on layer one Ethereum. I understand it. I know how it works, but there's like high gas and things are slow. Like you kind of do a transaction, you click submit, and then you walk away and you hope it works and you come back and you check. And that's kind of a real barrier to entry. Is that the sort of thing you guys are talking about addressing is to be able to have this layer two scaling and experience, but doing all the same things you would do on layer one? Exactly. Like preserving that magic that kind of got everyone so excited about Ethereum, but taking it to the next level and fixing the issues that we all feel, the pain points that we all face, right? I think I think Ethereum has done an incredible job at creating an ecosystem, but there are obvious low-hanging fruit that we need to address for this ecosystem to scale to a global user base. And one of those things has to be the developer experience side. I've talked to people where setting up your contracts and deploying them costs tens of thousands of dollars on gas fees if you're doing it, and then it's slow and it's really hard to test. Is this more focused towards that developer experience side or user experience or first one and then the other? How do you guys think about that? The most important thing is the user experience at the end of the day. But the reality is that for a good user experience, you first need a good developer experience. And so that means giving developers the tools that they need to build the amazing application for whatever users they are trying to build their application for. And the way that you actually get the most incredible user experiences is if you can scale the developer base to something that is really large so that a lot of different applications addressing a lot of different needs are actually created. So that means making the developer experience silky smooth, and that means creating an ecosystem that is reliable, secure, and long-lasting, right? We need solid foundations and a great developer experience on top of that to then enable what we want, which is good user experience. You talk about the magic of Ethereum that got people excited about the space. In your mind, like, what is that magic? For both of you, Ben, what are those experiences? I think one of the most exciting things to me, honestly, is that I think a lot of that magic has yet to be discovered. And that's like definitely the thing that drives me forward and gets me excited is like what we are enabling now on the infrastructural level is going to unlock those new experiences. With that being said, there's obviously so many incredible things that you can do on Ethereum today. You know, obviously your first stable coin creation was definitely an aha moment for me where I was like, oh my God, I have taken this ETH and longed it and created something stable and lots of things like that. The joy of sending transactions to the global trusted computer. Oh, it's too good. I love it too much. 
I'm with you on this idea of emergence, right? If you build a complex system with tons of moving parts, you don't know what's going to emerge. But then somebody posts something on Twitter and you read a thread that's like, here's how this new financial primitive will work. And it's mind blowing. Right. That's the magic, right? Yeah, exactly. And the innovation there is so critical. I think one of the interesting things, right, is when we first had the internet, the intuition was, oh, we can now put things on these screens digitally. Let's take what we have on paper and put it on a screen, right? We'll take our newspapers and we'll put them online. And it wasn't for a while that we realized, oh, the true innovation is not that the newspaper can publish, but that anybody in the world can publish whatever text they want, right? And then like social media exploded and it was this whole new thing. And both of those things were exciting. And it just keeps me up at night thinking about what is the social media of crypto that is the new use case that we haven't found yet. I feel like we have found it, but we haven't named it. Like it's not quite DeFi, it's not quite NFTs. It's something in those interactions. Maybe it's composability, value composability, but like it needs a way better name than that uh, uh, for it to catch on maybe. Carl, what's magic for you? I'm ready to name it World of Warcraft. No, I I think think that a lot of the magic of crypto for me comes down to a an experience that I had growing up, being on the internet, experiencing World of Warcraft, running around and not actually playing the game, but kind of just like talking to people and trying to hustle for money in weird, odd ways, right? Like there is an internet world that we are creating and that internet world, like the thing that, that is almost hard to wrap my head around is that Ethereum sits at the center of a very large set of tools and experiences, user experiences that even, you know, crypto Twitter is part of crypto Mm -hmm. and like Discord communities are part of crypto and part of Ethereum to me, right? Like you need that the kind of magic sauce that Ethereum gives you, that coordination, that trust, that value, that foundation, that auction house from World of Warcraft, you need that. But then it just births a really complex ecosystem of tools being used in ways that the creators did not intend. That's so exciting. So two things. What class did you play? I'll say Drew. I was a priest. So we can talk healing strategies later. Um, good, good to have a, a fellow Warcrafter. I knew that would serve me well. Part of the idea, okay, I'm going to use the term because I have to use the term, it's metaverse. And metaverse is often talked about as like this virtual reality layer. I don't buy that the metaverse is virtual reality. I think the metaverse is a digital world, essentially, that is it's just digital. It doesn't have to be virtual necessarily. It doesn't have to have virtual reality. And things like Ethereum and digital currencies and social media and Discord and communities that are online are part of that metaverse, whether or not you can see it through a virtual you know, headset. So to me, Ethereum and Optimism and Chainlink and these sort of infrastructure plays are part of that unseen world that makes the metaverse function. Like You don't see the wires running under my street, but I know they're going to get to my house eventually because I have electricity. There's a lot of this unseen thing in the real world as well. What do you think about that? Are we edging on metaverse or is that too much of a buzzword term for you? No, we are edging on metaverse. Yes. I, I, I have no shame at all. Like the analogy of building the kind of wiring that is going to connect and enable entire communities that exist solely online and kind of have a physical space, right? Like we are developing true community, true physical spaces on the internet. And in my opinion, that is an incredible thing. And as much as people are like, oh, I don't like people working on their computers all the times, looking at screens, whatever. To me, I think it is an amazing thing because it is going to liberate a lot of us from physical constraints that otherwise bind us to situations that otherwise we really wouldn't be choosing for ourselves. Speaking about you know this sort of infrastructure layer, so we want to make infrastructure for the metaverse, whatever that is, some digital reality that we're interacting in, whether or not we can see it and smell it eventually. We want to make that kind of seamless. So it seems like this EVM equivalence is a part of that. Is it making it seamless to go from a user or a developer through optimism to Ethereum? Is that a way to think about it? It definitely is. I think that what Carl was alluding to before, right, is that bottom coordination tool, the auction house, Carl called it. The thing that sort of enables those coordination layers is the EVM right now, right? Mm -hmm. And the core tenant of this release for us is understanding that that 
as a standard is extremely, extremely important. Because I think what we're going to see is as these different environments that provide these different experiences grow in popularity and reach different audiences, one of the things that's going to need to happen is they're going to need to move between those different environments, right? You can imagine some small game that's running on some tiny low security chain and suddenly it goes viral. Half the metaverse decides to start playing it. Well, you need more security for that all of a sudden. And so being able to take that application and deploy it on another chain effortlessly is going to be extremely, extremely important to that. I almost think of it as flexibility. It's about being moving between the different places in which these trust centers can be hosted and changing them over time. I think that's super, super important. The way you just used the word metaverse, like you meant multi-chain and cross-chain and people just moving from who are you know using private keys and cryptocurrency in one way or another, moving to one place. That's it. That's exactly what we we're talking about there. Yeah. There's some more functional boots on the ground challenges too, though, that we're working with right now, like liquidity. Like where is liquidity? If you want to have an auction house, a decentralized exchange, a DEX. Right now, if you want to move from layer one to layer two or cross-chain, you've got to migrate liquidity as well. Does this EVM equivalence deal with that at all? Like, like how do you guys deal with some of these nuts and bolts sort of things that are in smart contracts? Right. It's a good question. So it definitely isn't the ideal world that you want using this EVM equivalent stuff. What it can offer you is standardization. And I think that's extremely important. Like there's a fundamental property of this liquidity having to be moved around, Mm -hmm. right? Which corresponds to it being on different chains. And so that does introduce friction right now, but it also introduces value because you can move to one environment, which has some set of properties and another environment, which has another set of properties. Mm -hmm. And as long as you want those properties to be different, right? Which is certainly a valuable thing, especially if you want a decentralized, you know, multi-choice universe, you're going to need to have that because the liquidity being on different places is pretty much equivalent to those chains having different properties. Mm. But what equivalence can give you is standardization around how you move that around. And I think eventually the idea of liquidity bridging is not going to be something that end users are exposed to in the way that they are now. It's just going to you know, be invisible. It's the same way that Different websites are hosted on different IP addresses on the mm-hmm. internet today, but nobody's thinking about that, you know, about did I get routed to the Northeast US server or the, you know, Europe server? No one thinks about that today. They just go to a website and it gets served to them as quickly as it possibly can. And the reason that that all works is because IP is the standard. That means the Northeast server and the Europe server are communicating in the exact same way. Mm-hmm. So we can't necessarily offer something that is fundamental, which is that different chains have different properties and therefore the liquidity on them is different and not fungible. But we can offer a very standard way for those things to interact so that that becomes completely invisible to the end user, which is definitely what's going to happen. I'm interacting with the Chainlink ecosystem all the time. And part of what we talk about in the Chainlink ecosystem is that it is natively integrated on so many chains so that if you want to deploy your smart contracts on the next chain or on an L2, you've got the same standard understood security principles for that come with Chainlink oracles. Is that the sort of the same thing with this EVM equivalence? Somebody who wants to deploy their DAP on Optimism has the same Chainlink integration capabilities that they would on Ethereum Layer 1 or on any other EVM chain? Right. It's the exact same thing. And to Carl's point earlier about this being about developers and developers as a way to reach users, it's just as much about Chainlink being able to deploy all of that infrastructure with no changes exactly the same as on their other chains. So the fact that an EVM equivalent architecture means that Chainlink can be deployed to any EVM equivalent system Mm -hmm. without any work means that Chainlink will be there. And these are all the sort of fundamental requirements to be able to provide this seamless multi-chain experience to everyone. So yes. I get those questions all the time from enthusiasts. People just want to know, when is Chainlink going to be on my favorite chain or whatever it happens to be? And the answer is when it's ready. Like they got to code it. They got to make sure it works right. And they got to test it for security. So Having that EVM equivalence makes a lot of sense to me there. Exactly. Carl, what are your thoughts around this? I just thought Ben did a great job. Killed it. He just killed it. All right. Just killed cool. it. <laughs> Carl, I've known your voice for a while. I, I said it earlier, I think before we were recording, I've listened to a bunch of talks that you've given, podcasts and things, papers that you've written as I learned a lot more about Ethereum in my journey into crypto. So I'm kind of curious. I know you've been in the Ethereum ecosystem for a number of years. So here's a question. What has changed in your philosophy in the past five years or so building on Ethereum? Wow. I think 
Now, this is taking a bit of a detour from our EVM equivalents. That's cool. But I think that the essence of Ethereum has actually distilled for me. And there's a lot less complexity when I think about what Ethereum is doing for us and what Ethereum needs to do for us. Hmm. I started out my kind of journey thinking that Ethereum is going to solve the universe and save the world, right? And I do still think that. So I think that that is exactly the same. But I thought that the kind of equation or the way that it would save the world would be really complicated and convoluted and require long nights of mechanism design and economics research. But then as time has progressed, it showed me the reality that simplicity is so much stronger than I had originally imagined. So that means I thought that the way that you solve incentivization problems was that you you know, create a mechanism where every Friday XYZ happens and that triggers, you know, ABC. But it turns out that the way that you incentivize people to do what you think is good and what we collectively think is good is by providing an incentive, by giving them rewards for doing the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. This is this retroactive public goods funding. This is kind of part of the thesis around that that we've been experimenting with, it shows up all over in crypto. You see people reacting to incentives and the incentives are simple. It's just, you know, I get a reward for providing the service or doing this thing. And so it's so dumb and it's so simple, but it's actually so powerful. The fact that it's really just these, we have tokens representing ownership. We have NFTs representing this digital rights and space and art and creation and our ownership of objects. And then we have these incentivization governance mechanisms that live on top of that and kind of, you know, move everyone forward together. Like that's how we're all going to start coordinating and making the world a better place with Ethereum. It's not going to be fancy schmancy mechanism design thing that I thought originally. To your point, when I first learned about Ethereum and the gears start clicking, you could build so much stuff and, and your mind kind of goes, well, you could build this and that and the other and, you know, prediction markets and all sorts of things, marketplaces and taxes, and your brain kind of just goes on this could tangent. And then the reality of how people need to function is sometimes you just got to pay them for work. <laughs> like you just got to pay somebody <laughs> to do some work. And then once that happens, then more complex emergent phenomena do happen. But at the fundamental level, I mean, people need to eat. So you got to pay them for work. Can you guys talk a little bit about public goods funding? I've been reading your blogs about this. I'm a huge you know, supporter of Gitcoin and incentivizing and grants in the space as well, Chainlink grants. Talk a little bit about retroactive public goods funding and what you guys have been working on with that. Retroactive public goods funding actually ties in more than you'd think with EVM equivalents. So we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Realistically, these Geth clients, the open source software that makes crypto go, is all built for Ethereum, for the EVM. And it's been working for six, seven years. And it's just amazing. I can't even express how valuable those contributions have been. But the reality is that people building that infrastructure that we are all using today are not getting rewarded nearly enough compared to the other projects, various things that get funded in this ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? Our mining rewards, for instance, where there's millions of dollars being created every single day, being generated every single day and given to miners, and we spend a fraction of a percent on our core protocol development. And so the basic concept here is we aren't spending enough on these very important public goods, right? A public good just being something that is benefiting the public, roughly. So we should just reward them more heavily. We need to write that balance. The scale is out of whack. And so thankfully, we are happily creating a layer two protocol, which generates transaction fees, just like you know Ethereum L1. Ethereum L1 burns those transaction fees. You can't give them back to users because that would defeat the purpose of a transaction fee. So you have to repurpose those transaction fees somehow. And then the question is, where do you give those transaction fees? Well, give it back to the community. 
and give it back in a way that benefits everyone. And so that's this kind of concept of retroactive public goods funding. You recognize who has done incredible work that has not been rewarded their fair share, and you give them funding. So I feel like presently and in the past, that model has worked on donors with means deciding, hey, I need to donate to this and support this. Like that's what grants are. That's what, you know, quadratic funding and Gitcoin essentially is, is, hey, we need to support this. So here's money continuing going and doing this. How is what you guys are proposing different than that? Is it built into the fee structure so that it pays out almost like a mining reward for people that are doing that? Or is there some other mechanism? It's definitely the case that you, you know, involve protocol fees at that level. I think that's what Carl was basically mm-hmm. alluding to is that layer two gives us this chance to retune some of those parameters where we can't because Ethereum itself is set in stone and it's hard to fork and governance is difficult. There's one aspect of it that is definitely different, which is that the funding source of this money can come from actual protocol revenue as opposed to something like Gitcoin, right? Which, mm-hmm. like you said, is like mostly donation driven. That's one side of it. The other side of what we're doing is where the retroactive word really comes into play. Mm -hmm. And basically, the reason to do things retroactively is because it turns what is normally a very difficult problem of grants giving, right? There's a question of when you're funding this Gitcoin grant, is the person that you're funding or is the project that you're funding going to accomplish what you want? And is Mm -hmm. what they're going to accomplish actually going to be good for the ecosystem? And that can be a very hard thing to predict and very hard to do right. So the idea of retroactive funding is instead of giving that funding up front, give that funding after it's been completed. Mm -hmm. This is basically a much easier problem to solve because you no longer have to predict as the source of revenue who is going to be doing well. And what you layer on that with is the argument that the market should be able to predict this well. So one concern you might have is if people are only going to get paid afterwards, then they might not be willing to do this or they might not have the means to do this. But the idea is that by funding things retroactively, a market of investors can basically say, I think that this person will get paid out because I believe that what they're doing is going to be extremely, extremely valuable for the community and for the public. And because markets are better at deciding things like this than perhaps the source of revenue or a particular protocol governance mechanism, the argument is that we will be able to much, much better invest these funds than they otherwise could be. So that's sort of the two parts to this. It's the new revenue source and it's the retroactive market that you can direct it towards. You know, the game theory components on there is really challenging. I'm very curious to see how that works out. So I want to touch base with you guys in a couple of months, maybe, and kind of see how that's developed. I've seen a couple of NFT projects that are trying to do bake in donating at their sort of transaction level. So when you mint, you know, it's part of the smart contract to send the funds to this wallet that goes to Gitcoin and this that goes to give ETH and, and other things like that. So I know people are thinking about that. I think it is really interesting that at the protocol level for transaction fees, you can kind of build in this granting system and then to have it retroactive is this exciting mechanism on top. So really fascinating stuff. We got to know Carl a little bit, at least how his thinking has changed, Ben. But I want to get to know you guys like on a personal level as well. So let's take just a minute. What is a hobby or a field that has nothing to do with blockchain or crypto now or in the past, like something that you've learned, maybe as a kid even, where you have a weird, deep level of expertise? What are you an expert at? I don't really consider myself an expert in this, but a longtime hobby of mine has been music. So I will take a minute to show my Twitter, which is at Ben underscore chain. I'm sure there'll be a link somewhere. Yep. But the problem with this answer is that I have started turning it into a crypto related thing. So my one big hobby that I had that was totally unrelated was just, you know, sitting on my keyboard and making music. I've started making Ethereum and crypto parody songs. Are you that guy? Uh, yeah, that's me. That's I've me. seen you. You're fantastic. Oh, I, I appreciate that. Oh, you have a fan here. I didn't know was, that was you. I just hadn't paid attention to the name. Oh, man, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, I appreciate that. So that would have been my answer. And hopefully you'll allow it because I have accidentally turned it into a crypto hobby. <laughs> I have Now I can hear your voice. I can hear it, man. Oh, man, I'm totally shocked. I'm very pleased. That's a great <laughs> hobby. I'm a bit of a musician as well. I'm terrible, but I absolutely love music. So What is it about music, not just crypto parodies, but what is it about music that speaks to you? Definitely the thing that has been exciting me the most recently that I'm absolutely garbage at and far from an expert in, but I do think the math of music is very, very, very compelling and very fascinating. And the idea of like scales being broken down into twelfths because Mm -hmm. 
somehow this is very pleasing because base 12 has many, you know, the number 12 has a lot of divisors and all the relationships between chords and the circle of fifths. Mm-hmm. That all is super fascinating and, you know, appealing to me from a math background. More than that, though, I just love the vibes. I love the energy of being able to jam in this way that is sort of understood by everyone. It's another universal language alongside math. I will shout out, though, that the way that I was first introduced to Carl, as a matter of fact, was immediately after watching him freestyle rap in front of an audience at a crypto panel. I've probably seen that video as well. It's very likely. So we've got some real musical roots on the team, for sure. I love the math of music idea as well. I'm a metalhead. Like I like oppressive death metal. Like it's definitely stuff you Mm. cannot listen to, (laughs) but there's math metal that just plays with all of those signatures and speeds. You know, the drummers just get on some weird vibe and things get weird. So, all right, we'll talk some math metal sometime. Carl, what about you? What what are you an expert in that's not crypto? Well, Ben already got the music stuff. So I will say freestyling and hip hop are extremely close to my heart. The flow state that you enter is amazing when you are freestyling and jamming generally with music. I would say that in some ways I kind of consider everything that I do integrated into a higher level system and Mm -hmm. set of beliefs and values. So I wouldn't say that this is totally distinct from crypto, but I will call out my affinity for spirituality and science, both of those things. My mom raised me as a uh, as a Hindu, and even actually as a. I also went to church, so it was a very bizarre set of religious upbringings. And my dad is an atheist, very hardcore, and just like religiously doesn't believe in God, you mm-hmm. know. And that was one of the things that I really wanted to address because I love uncertainty and I don't believe anything. The thing that gets me very excited is this: is trying to understand what consciousness is, trying to understand how to approach the world and how to kind of go through things with a light touch and an open hand, just take things one at a time. If you're lucky enough to catch Carl in the right moment, he will blow your mind by making you understand that blockchains are some sort of algorithmic compression that is an AI. Your mind will be blown. It's unbelievable. I'm in. Let's get together. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it. I'm not an expert by any means, but I am a student of many religions. I I find it extremely fascinating the way that people make sense of the world and how so many religions have share similarities, yet differences and provoke such incredible emotions in people. So not as spiritual, but I am certainly religious in many ways. So maybe we do need to get together and have a uh, chat about maybe over music. We'll freestyle rap, religion and spirituality. Ben can make a song about it. Beautiful. Thank you guys for coming on. Where should people go to find out more about what you guys are up to, what you're building, what's next? Optimism.io, jobs.optimism.io. We are definitely hiring. Twitter, Optimism PBC. I am at Carl underscore dot underscore tech. Ben is at Ben Chain. That's amazing. Thank you guys so much for coming on. We'll talk to you again soon. I love the idea of making magic happen on Ethereum and those magical moments. I still get a kick out of thinking through those design potentials in Web3. The EVM and other approaches to blockchain-based applications enable such incredible innovation like retroactive public goods funding, streaming payments, or DeFi in general, and whatever other innovators come up with in the coming decades. In my view and why I'm here doing this, Chainlink provides a crucial element of infrastructure for these innovations, namely decentralized networks for secure middleware between off and on-chain systems, whether that's with native blockchain protocols or existing enterprise stacks. Thank you to Carl and Ben for coming on and giving me some great insights. I will definitely keep up with Optimism and Ethereum parody songs (laughs) and Ethereum in general. Seriously, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come and chat. Now, help me grow the Chainlink podcast to give more projects a voice to speak to the Chainlink community and beyond. Rate and review on iTunes or whatever your favorite podcasting app is. And make sure to follow Chainlink on Spotify as well, please. Follow me on Twitter at Andy Boyan and share this episode with your friends who need to get deeper insight into Web3 and especially into Layer 2. Also, follow Chainlink Today on Twitter at Chainlink Today and read more about the stories behind the industry's top projects. While you're joining, join the Chainlink communities. Find other Web3 explorers in the Chainlink Telegram and Discord chats. You can also follow Optimism, Ben and Carl to stay up to date on their developments. Those links are all in the podcast description, so go and click them. Hey, thanks for hanging out. I'll catch you next time. Thank you.